disinformation, international disinformation impact on the EU's climate goals. It's a meeting that we uh, hold in association with the Committee uh, on the Environmental, Public Health and Food Safety and the Panel for the Future of Science and Technology, STOA. Uh, with uh, John Cook, which is Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University. John Rusenbeck, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow, Department of Psychology, the University, Cambridge University. And finally, Jenny King, Head of Climate Research and Policy Institute for a Strategic Dialogue. Dear colleagues, one of the biggest hurdles in the fight against climate change is climate disinformation. According to a well-known definition, climate disinformation refers to either of the following practices. Content that uh, undermines the existence of climate change or its impact, the human influence on climate change, and the need for urgent action in line with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Content that misrepresent uh, scientific data, including biomission or cherry picking, in order to erode trust in climate science, or finally, content that uh, falsely publicizes efforts as supportive of climate goals that in fact contribute to climate warming or even contravene the scientific consensus on mitigation or adaptation. The European Green Deal aims at making the EU climate neutral by 2050. And the European climate law sets an intermediate target of reducing net greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030, compared to 1990 levels. Climate change disinformation is a major roadblock towards achieving those targets. It is therefore crucial to hear from experts about their ex experience and recommendations to address this type of disinformation and I welcome Mr. Ibars uh, Hijabs, Vice Chair of the European Parliament's Panel for the Future of Science and Technology, STOA, uh, for his uh, introductory remarks. So, um, uh, dear colleague, I am glad to give you the floor as Vice Chair of the STOA panel for your uh, opening remarks. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you for your participation in this event and here representing the STOA panel, which is a panel for uh, future of science and technology. Of course, during the last uh, years in this convocation of the European Parliament, we have been through a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, different kinds of debates on how to tackle the uh, situation with trust in uh, science, which is uh, not just a, a purely theoretical issue, but also a very practical social issue which has to be solved. In the last year, STOA, the panel of the future of science and technology, has been much engaged in taking up this challenge of tackling this in, disinformation and misinformation, notably via the, net for, the work of the European Science Media Hub. This is uh, one of our outlets here in the STOA panel. Uh, uh, we know that trust in science is a key element to tackle disinformation. We also understand that the collaboration between media scientists and policy makers is fundamental. With the European Science Media Hub, we are trying to engage with scientists and with media in Europe and to promote scientific evidence and science literacy, helping the public and citizens to identify quality news and inform themselves without falling into the trap of disinformation and misinformation. The European Science Media Hub has been actively involved in knowledge exchange in the field of disinformation research, awareness raising, synergies with partners and stakeholders. And uh, this is also one of the contributions uh, how we have been uh, uh, trying to address uh, the current uh, Issue, issue also regarding, of course, uh, the very goal of the last five years of the uh, European Parliament, which is the Green Deal and fighting the climate change. And that's why I'm looking forward very much to uh, the presentations of our, of our esteemed guests. Thank you very much.
Sorry. Members of the committee, uh, the MB committee, were also invited to this uh, hearing. So, of course, they are welcome uh, to take part in it. So, let's now uh, turn to our experts. Uh, starting with uh, Mr. John Cook. Mr. Cook, you are a research fellow with the Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University in Australia. You have researched extensively on climate change uh, denialism and how to deconstruct and debunk climate misinformation. So I'm sure that uh, you have very interesting um, contribution to make to to the uh, deliberations of this, uh, of this committee. And I'm glad to give you the floor for uh, initially for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to talk about our research into understanding and countering misinformation about climate change. Um, just to clarify, my affiliation is now at the University of Melbourne. Today, I'll be talking about our work into using machine learning research to detect and categorise climate misinformation from several different online sources. Uh, if we get, could go to the next slide, please. So working with Travis Cohen and Miriam Nanko from Exeter University and Constantine Brusalis from Trinity College Dublin, we developed a taxonomy of contrarian climate claims that come from misinformation sources like conservative think tanks and denialist blogs. We found that there are five main categories of climate misinformation, and they, they echo some of the, um, the categories that were mentioned uh, in the introductory remarks. The first three are about science issues, arguing that global warming isn't happening, that humans aren't causing global warming, or that climate impacts aren't bad. The fourth category of climate misinformation is solutions-based, arguing that climate policy or clean energy is either harmful or ineffective. The fifth category involves attacks on climate science or on climate actors, mostly scientists. The purpose of arguments in this fifth category is to erode public trust in climate science. Once we had developed a, this taxonomy of contrarian claims, we then trained a machine learning model to detect each of these claims in online text. And this enabled us to construct a history of climate misinformation over the last two decades, which I show in the next slides, please. When we looked at misinformation coming from conservative think tanks, we found a strong emphasis on climate solutions, shown in the black line in this graph. The main arguments were that climate policies were harmful or that renewable uh, solutions wouldn't work. We also saw an increasing trend towards solutions. We see that the black line is increasing uh, as we go further into time. Climate misinformation is transitioning away from science denial and towards solutions denial. This tells us that uh, misinformation targeting climate solutions is really the future of climate misinformation. If we could go to the next slide, um, what we show here is a constructed history of climate misinformation on denialist blogs. Here we also found a transition towards climate solutions. We see the, the black line, although it's not as prominent here, uh, but it still shows that upwards trend uh, indicating a transition towards solutions misinformation. However, in the case of blogs, the much greater category was attacks on science. This was about trying to undermine public trust in the science. It's important to note that in both cases, conservative think tanks or denialist blogs, the first three categories that were focused on science issues were the least common forms of climate misinformation. This is notable because most research and education efforts to counter climate misinformation tend to focus on science issues, while actual climate misinformation out in the world is more focused on casting doubt on solutions or attacking the science. If we could go to the next slide. Next I'm going to talk about um, research that was done late last year by my colleagues at Exeter and Trinity College working with the Climate Action Against Disinformation Group to study uh, climate misinformation on social media. They analysed social media posts from Twitter and Facebook 
scraped during the two weeks of the COP climate summit last November. This, consistent with our results that I showed just in the, in the previous slides, what we saw were the top six misinformation categories shown on the right side of these sli slides here. They involved either attacking solutions, oh sorry, if we could go back to the previous slide. Um, so the, the most common categories involved either attacking solutions or climate actors or the climate science itself. In fact, we found that the most common form of climate misinformation on social media during COP was attacks on climate actors. Uh, this involved either attacking climate scientists or environmentalists or scientific institutions like the IPCC. If we could go to the next slide now. Now, more recently, myself and my colleagues, um, Christian Cardenas and Yuan Fang Li at Monash University, We've been working with the University of Hamburg, who have scraped over three million tweets about climate change over the last six months of 2022. We were interested in whether there was a change in climate misinformation on Twitter after Elon Musk took over the platform, given that he was unbanning a number of extremist accounts that had previously been banned for posting misinformation and other problematic content. The next slide shows our results we found that just over 10% of climate tweets were identified by our model as misinformation. The green bar in this graph here indicates the, GOP, uh, sorry, the COP climate summit in November. Uh, Musk started on banning extremist accounts towards the end of COP in mid-November. We can see the, the arrow down towards the bottom right of the graph. Our preliminary analysis showed no discernible shift in climate misinformation over this transitional period. This indicates that climate misinformation is relatively stable, which we also saw over the longer two decade time periods in our previous slides. The next slide shows how we also sorted the misinformation tweets into their different categories. Over the six month period last year, Personal attacks on climate actors was by far the largest category. 55% of all climate misinformation on Twitter involved personal attacks on climate actors. Casting doubt on climate policy was the second most common type of misinformation. And interestingly, the third most common category was arguing that global warming was caused by natural cycles. While science myths are diminishing, there's still a persistent presence in social media misinformation. Uh, onto my final slide now. To summarise, the two... Oh, well, some, are we missing a slide? Uh, I think we are. All right, so um, that's OK. Uh, uh, just to summarise, the two most common types of climate misinformation are solutions denial and personal attacks on climate actors. Yet these are both unstudied. What is the impact of attacks on scientists and the science itself? Do they erode public trust in climate science? Uh, and importantly, do they decrease support for climate policy? And what are the effective interventions that can counter personal attacks and build up public trust in climate science? There also needs to be an increased focus on understanding and countering solutions misinformation. Recent research has documented insidious forms of solutions denial, like uh, what researchers call the discourses of delay. We need to be able to automatically detect those kinds of misinformation in the same way that we can currently detect other forms of climate misinformation in our taxonomy. Similarly, we also need to be able to detect greenwashing, where industries misrepresent their activities as being more environmentally friendly than they actually are. Research into both these types of misinformation are urgently needed so that any interventions that we design to counter them are robust and evidence-based. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cook, for this intervention. Stay with us for the um, um, Q&A um, session. And uh, <clears throat> now... We move on to uh, Dr. Rusenbeck. 
Dr. Rusumbe, you are a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge. Your expertise on misinformation, online extremism and fake news uh, games will be very uh, useful to us. The psychological component of this information and the way this information um, um, uh, builds on the uh, psychological bias uh, uh, that uh, we all have um, is extremely important for understanding this phenomenon. So I am um, glad to give the floor to uh, Dr. John Rosenbeck for um, initially 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, very kind of you to invite <coughs> me here to come speak. Let me first check if my slides are working. They seem to be, but there's a slight delay. Okay, good to know. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I uh, decided to summarize the main point of my presentation today in a single sentence. Um, the most harmful climate disinformation is partly true. And uh, my work uh, at the University of Cambridge focuses to a large extent on pointing out manipulation strategies and manipulation techniques in various forms of online content and how to counter those. And I thought I would use this time to uh, point out several of the more insidious strategies that are often used in climate disinformation. So, to begin, I think, a little history. Uh, in 1994, a whistleblower known as Mr. Butts sent about 4,000 internal tobacco industry documents to Stanton Glantz, a professor at the University of California, and these documents uh, were then analyzed by Professor Glantz and revealed a disinformation playbook used by tobacco companies to delay and soften legislation. What does that look like? What does this playbook look like? It looks like this. So there are basically three components as I've summarized them. There are more, of course, but three relevant ones for the moment. Number one, sow doubt. Number two, counterattack. And number three, do not lie, or at least not too much. So... I think it's very, very important that we understand this. Um, I've, I've listed several quotes from these internal communications by this tobacco company called Brown and Williamson that I think are relevant to these points. First one, so doubt. It says, if you can't read it from afar, doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. It is also the means of establishing a controversy. If we are successful in establishing a controversy at the public level, then there is an opportunity to put across the real facts about smoking and health. Obviously, these real facts about smoking and health are not that smoking causes cancer and so on. Point number two, counterattack. Interesting and revealing quote. Our goal is to expose the incredible, unprecedented and nefarious attack against the cigarette, constituting the greatest libel and slander ever perpetrated against any product in the history of free enterprise. Of course, slight mild exaggeration, perhaps. Nonetheless, it is uh, an important point to take this into account. And number three, do not lie, or at least not too much. Relevant quote here is that truth is our message because of its power to withstand a conflict and sustain a controversy. If in our pro-cigarette efforts we stick to well-documented fact, we can dominate a controversy and operate with the confidence of justifiable self-interest. Now, of course, uh, tobacco legislation did come about in more recent years. However, it was not without a fight. What I think is very important to note is that this exact same playbook is applied in the debate about climate change. So this is a paper, which is an absolutely wonderful paper, that was published by Jeffrey Sopran and Naomi Oreskes at Harvard University in 2021, where they analyzed uh, however many years of communications put out by fossil fuel company ExxonMobil, identifying several rhetorical strategies used in ExxonMobil editorials aimed at delaying and softening climate action. And so here, again, we see the exact same playbook, and I've again listed a couple of quotes from that article that I think are relevant. Number one, so doubt. There does not appear to be a consensus among scientists about the effect of fossil fuel use on climate change. Again, what they mean is there is no an uh, unanimity. There is a consensus, just not unanimity, which is to say if one person disagrees, that's already no longer unanimous. Number two, counterattack. Consumer demand for energy, rather than corporate supply of oil, coal, and gas, is the cause of fossil fuel production and, by extension, anthropogenic global warming. 
in the sense that the blame is shifted away from the production of fossil fuels and towards the demand for the consumption of them. And number three, again, very important, do not lie, or at least not too much. Beyond outright disinformation, the article notes, ExxonMobil may have employed rhetoric and framing to construct misleading public narratives about anthropogenic global warming. And so how does that play out in practice? This is a fascinating article, in case you're interested in looking it up, called The Garbon Footprint Sham. It's a slightly provocative title. I do not think it's a sham personally, completely at least, but nonetheless, the points raised are very interesting. This is an article by Mark Kaufman in uh, Mashable. And Kaufman notes that in 2000, British Petroleum and the PR agency Ogilvy and Mather launched what they called the Beyond Petroleum campaign. And as part of this campaign, they also launched a carbon footprint calculator. And what this did, as I'm sure you're familiar with the concept, is the idea behind uh, popularizing the carbon footprint um, as a metric of individual people's carbon emissions helped shift responsibility for climate action to the individual, meaning individual consumers can contribute to reducing climate change by flying less and eating less meat, and so on. Interesting side point in 2020 when the whole world stopped flying and traveling altogether pretty much because of COVID, uh, CO2 emissions dropped by approximately 8% compared to 2019, which is a substantial drop to be sure, but it also means that that's not how we solve this problem. There are other measures that are necessary. Okay. What I want to say here is it, the problem is not that individual arguments made in these kinds of campaigns and made by the fossil fuel industry when it comes to climate change and global emissions. It's not the case that these arguments per se are unreasonable. It is good in principle to fly less and to eat less meat if you're thinking about your environmental impact. That is correct. And some of these measures can be impactful at a global scale if, again, implemented consistently. But the problem here that I want to argue is that we are dealing with a very subtle problem. The problem lies in the subtlety of the argumentation. The point is not to have a genuine discussion about the best way to tackle climate change, but rather to ensure that the focus stays away from curbing, curbing fossil fuel extraction. Again, as the image says, it's time to go on a low carbon diet. Who goes on a diet? To conclude, and I realize that I have some time left, there are three th points that I think are important to take away. Number one, climate disinformation is a serious problem, but the definition is often too much focused on the veracity of the arguments that are made, as my colleague John Cook just pointed out. Whereas in reality, we're not dealing with lies all that much. We're dealing with a very subtle rhetorical strategy or a set of strategies. And companies such as British Petroleum, ExxonMobil, Shell, and also state-owned oil companies such as Saudi Aramco continue to run these kinds of what you might call PR campaigns to influence public opinion and to avoid costly climate measures as much as possible. I think especially important to point out while I'm here is that lawmakers and policymakers often are the target of these kinds of communications and of these kinds of rhetorical strategies. When talking to lawmakers and policymakers, lying is not a very good strategy, tends to be. And again, as I've emphasized, I think repeatedly now, the manipulation that occurs here is much more subtle than outright lies. And it's important, finally, to bear in mind the goal of these kinds of communications, which is to delay and or soften relevant legislation, which cut into cut, uh, profits to a large extent. In my personal view, it's a mistake to assume that many of these arguments, especially when they come from PR campaigns run by the fossil fuel industry, are made in good faith. We are not having an honest discussion about the best ways to tackle climate change and anthropogenic global warming. Um, and finally, the more we focus, and that includes not only me, but that also includes this legislative body, on individual responsibility and so-called consumer demand, the more we avoid talking about reducing production. Thank you all very much. Uh, I look forward to your questions and comments. And if you have any further questions, this is my email address. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay with us. 
And now we are going to give the floor to Mrs. Jenny King. Mrs. King, you are the head of climate research and policy at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. Your experience on climate denialism and discourses of delay in implementing uh, climate policy shall come of use in our discussion. So, um, again, the floor is yours, Ms. Jenny King, for 10 minutes. We can hear you, but we can see you, but we can't hear you. There is some issue with the audio. Can you hear me now? We can, we can, we can hear you now, yes. I wonder whether the sound is... Uh, uh, of uh, enough quality to be to be interpreted. Um, let me know if I need to try a different microphone. Is that coming through at all? Yeah, no. The interpreters confirm that uh, the, the 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 quality of the sound of the other is too poor to be interpreted. Okay, one second. Uh, is that any better? I think it's slightly better, but it is for interpreters to decide whether they are in, uh, ready to, to, to interpret. Well, let's try. We'll see. But it's, just, it's, slightly, it's slightly better, and I, I would um, uh, kindly ask our interpreters to, to, do, uh, to do their best, as they usually do. Let's see. Okay. Please let me know if I need to stop at any point. Thank you very much for having me today, and I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there in person in Brussels. Um, I think that the Johns, both Johns, have already covered a lot of the key narrative shifts in climate mis and disinformation yep. in recent years. Oh, so Miss, the, Miss, Miss, Miss King, the interpreters confirm that uh, they cannot interpret that. So I suggest you, you uh, continue in, uh, in English, and we'll and we'll, um, uh, we'll try to, to, to follow you. So please, go, go ahead. Okay, I'm very, very sorry about that. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, there's only one point that I'd like to add um, from both of the speeches that have come previously around the narrative shifts in climate mis- and disinformation. And I think it should be of great concern to this committee and to the European Union as a whole that public understanding of both climate change as a phenomenon and climate action are being distorted through the lens of disinformation, of conspiracy theories, and in the most extreme cases of targeted abuse. And what is happening to the environmental agenda now mirrors the fate of other policy issues in recent years, in particular public health, migration, civil rights and electoral integrity. And all of those areas require scrutiny and dialogue between citizens and governments. But unfortunately, the current information landscape has and continues to make it ever harder to build a public mandate that is based on credible science and is in line with the EU's commitments over the coming years. And I think another point on that front is that COVID-19, it was a crucible for mis- and disinformation on all fronts, in which diverse groups came into collision online and new hybrid conspiracies were formed that mixed everything from vaccine scepticism and climate denial with extreme ideas that were linked to white supremacy or even anti-Semitism. And since 2020, ISD, the organization that I work for, has documented how the trauma of that period is being weaponized by those opposed to climate action, who have successfully laundered what we call these delayist talking points and a new breed of climate denial firmly into the mainstream of public life. And that trend thrives in part due to a historic erosion of trust in institutions across Europe and beyond. And that's an erosion of trust in elected officials, in multilateral bodies like the European Parliament, in scientists, in the media. And what that trend means is that you have the drowning out of legitimate questions or even concerns about climate policy by this mass of baseless claims, of smear campaigns and of misleading propaganda, much of which is coming from the fossil fuel industry itself. And what our research reveals, as well as that of our wider coalition, which is called Climate Action Against Disinformation, 
is that this problem is also fueled and compounded by weaknesses in digital platforms. There are very clear vulnerabilities in the way that social media platforms are designed and governed at the moment, and it allows mis- and disinformation content to rise to the surface, and in many cases to dominate public discussion about climate policy at a time when, as the IPC said in its uh, report last year, there is a brief and rapidly closing window to act on this policy. And those flaws in our online space are continually exploited, not just by fossil fuel companies and those with vested interests in maintaining the carbon economy, but also by hostile actors who see climate as another axis to spread distrust, to drive division and to weaken democratic processes in societies all across the European Union and around the world. There are three particular areas that I'd like to highlight today, which are advertising, monetization, and amplification on the online space. With advertising, the, the ecosystem online amplifies climate mis- and disinformation in two really important ways. The first is that it creates a funding model for disinformation actors and outlets who are able to generate advertising revenue by spreading the most incendiary, false or misleading content online. The second, which is maybe less considered in some of these policy discussions, is by increasing reach as the advertising tools themselves can be applied to dis disinformation or greenwashing content to target consumers and citizens and other key constituencies. It's the case that digital advertising has a supply chain which remains very complicated and opaque, even to those who spend their entire lives trying to dig into them. And it's facilitated by technology which few of us in everyday life understand. And that vastly increases the opportunity for monetizing climate denial and the kinds of discourses of delay that John Cook and John Rosenbeek have spoken about in the previous speeches. And that's created a profit model which undermines the efforts of brands who have climate targets, but are inadvertently funding the worst forms of mis- and disinformation by advertising without their knowledge on these sites. It also allows those with the greatest financial resources, such as you know, Exxon, BP, some of those other entities that have been mentioned, to pay for exposure to millions of unsuspecting users even when they are promoting, at best, misleading, and at worst, actively false claims about the climate crisis. For companies like Meta or Amazon or Twitter to generate revenue from content that denies climate change is a reality, that promotes non-viable solutions, or that targets harassment against specific individuals it should be unacceptable in any case, but it's even more acute when those same companies are continually touting their climate credentials and the E in their ESG agendas, their environmental agendas. I just wanted to illustrate with a couple of examples. One piece of research that we conducted with the University of Exeter last year showed that there were over 3,700 adverts live from fossil fuel linked entities around the COP27 summit. And they spent roughly three to four million dollars on just Facebook and Instagram campaigns in three months. The top 10 pages for ad volume or spend in that period were almost all industry PR and lobbying groups. And what's really important to notice here, that many of those groups are masquerading behind names that make them seem as if they're grassroots or community led. Names like Energy Citizens or, you know, Community Alliance for a Safe Future. And some of the most prolific advertisers posted ads with active climate denial. For example, claiming that there is not consensus around climate change amongst the scientific community or asking questions like, has environmentalism become a religion? And as I said at the start, those campaigns are increasingly couched in quite divisive rhetoric that draws links between climate action and a supposed loss of civil liberties, shadowy agendas or economic crisis. Google, as one case study, implemented a policy in 2021 which was explicitly intended to demonetize climate denial across its products and services. And Claire from GDI actually mentioned that in the previous session. 
But analysis that's been done by partners of ours, including the Dewey Square Group and Friends of the Earth, reviewed 113 of the top websites that are spreading climate misinformation, sites that cumulatively reach over 56 million weekly visits, according to the data we have at our disposal. And 80% of those sites displayed advertising via one or more of the major ad tech providers, such as Google and Amazon. And so those middleman companies are not only profiting from climate misinformation, but they're actually allowing sites who repeatedly share falsehoods and attacks to turn that activity into a viable business model. I think that takes me into the second point, which is that the crisis around mis and disinformation on climate change is not just an issue of false content alone, and that debate about content removal has obscured some of the bigger issues here, which is the role that distribution mechanisms play in amplifying and targeting content beyond its original audience. I think this was a really big theme in the session that took place directly before ours. And those mechanisms, whether it's the micro-targeting of, of adverts or recommendation algorithms, they constantly make decisions for users about what they see online in ways that are largely invisible to the average person. And they play an intrinsic role in the disinformation ecosystem, spreading dangerous content that might otherwise have had quite limited reach. So the largest, largest technology companies like Twitter, like Meta, like Google, they claim to be tackling disinformation, whether it's on climate or other issue sets, through policies within their terms of service. So, for example, they might say that they engage third party fact checkers. And the premise is that those entities will rate content as false or misleading. And that content will then be downranked or potentially removed. And maybe some punitive action will be taken against the accounts, depending on the severity of the content and the number of strikes already recorded by the platform. Those measures should be properly enforced based on the existing community guidelines, in terms of service, and they should prevent repeat offenders from acting with impunity. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And even for the, the types of disinformation that are explicitly covered by company policies. Now, what we found at ISD, and it mirrors the same trends in areas like public health, is that a very small group of actors create the majority of anti-climate content. They originate or amplify new lines of attack, and they have a disproportionate influence on the public debate across social media. Now, just to make things even worse, the highest traction posts, more often than not, come from verified or, or what are sometimes referred to as blue tick accounts and pages who are afforded additional visibility and credibility via that status. And in the four week period before, during and, and directly after COP27, we found that just a dozen actors, so 12 accounts, posted nearly 400 times on Twitter using common disinformation language around climate. And they managed to garner an aggregate of nearly 350,000 shares from that content. Now, the organic reach of those accounts varies from 65,000 to 1.9 million followers. So those are just the people who choose to follow them, regardless of the wider amplification. And nine of those 12 super spreader accounts were at the time and remain verified accounts. And what, what we know is that sensational content fuels the outrage economy and it therefore serves the current business model of most platforms and climate is not an exception in that case. Whether it's outright denial or other forms of disinformation, content like this is generally high engagement. It you know, garners clicks and likes and shares and comments and that increases the value proposition for advertisers on social media. And so when sites like Facebook they tout their climate science center. My response is that those efforts end up being somewhat moot. You know, Facebook has said that they've had a reported 100,000 daily visitors to the climate science center in the past, but we know that organic content from known super spreaders of disinformation gains vastly more reach and visibility. And in 2021, a study from our COP26 intelligence unit found that just a handful of pages who were known to spread climate misinformation on Facebook, actually outperformed the accounts within the platform's own climate science center by, on average, 
a factor of 12. So 12 times more likes and shares and comments. Meanwhile, in the same year on Twitter, just 16 misinformation super spreader accounts amassed over 500,000 likes and retweets for their climate content. And those 16 outperformed a combined total of 148 other prominent deniers and skeptics on the platform. So even within the climate opposition space, the influence is actually consolidated in a very small group. And one other thing that I want to emphasize is that the repeat offenders I'm, we're talking about here, they've often spread mis or disinformation on multiple topics. So that could be anti-vaccination sentiment, it could be genocide denial, it could be extreme conspiracies like QAnon or the Great Reset or really damaging conspiracies around electoral fraud. And many of those accounts have been fact-checked multiple times by certified bodies like the International Fact-Checking Network, and yet they continually hit views and likes and share figures that are in the million. And that should provide an even greater incentive for us to act, since an effective response against these accounts could have a false multiplier effect. I think I'm coming to the end of my time, so I just want to finish yeah. with what some of the solutions Wrap our up, are. are. Um, and then I'll take some questions on those. You know, the first, which I think has been talked about, is having robust and meaningful transparency on this issue within the DSA. The second is applying more stringent criteria for how advertising products and services are used, both online and offline. And the third, which is important for the European Union, is adopting a clear definition and parameters for this problem, which can galvanize a response across the region and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. King. Uh, stay with us for the Q&A session that I open now. Um, and giving the floor to the members uh, who would like to address questions to our guests for a couple of minutes, minutes each. And now, <coughs> let me start by a question um, from myself. Um, the, uh, I mean, the war in, in Ukraine has, to some extent, um, an, an ensuing uh, energy crisis has. Um, um, reopen uh, the uh, debate on energy um, uh, with, um, I mean, new um, public policy options, uh, new um, challenges. Um, uh, to what extent the uh, reopening of, of, of the energy um, debate as a result of the of the uh, Ukrainian war, the war in Ukraine um, has um, impacted? the ways in which this information is, uh, is, 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 is working through uh, social media on the way uh, this information on climate change has, uh, let's say, adjusted to, to, this, uh, to this new situation. Then, um, yes, please. Well, uh, you, you want to take them all question? together. No, uh, I, I had a question regarding uh, to all the three uh, distinguished speakers whom I all thank for their participation and their valuable contributions. I was just asking, the, uh, thinking about the, well, receiving end uh, of the disinformation in a sense that what we can observe in many countries is a certain correlation uh, of the receptiveness regarding the climate disinformation and other uh, attitudes like, uh, well, the right-wing populism, responsiveness to that, extreme views on other issues, conspiracy theories, uh, a lot of social media consumption. So in, in that sense, I think that uh, we are dealing with a with a, a phenomenon which is broader than just the distrust in science regarding climate change and what might be the possible social causes uh, for that in, in sociological and economic terms. Is it about this anti-elitist sentiment and climate change being, well, perceived as a kind of elitist conspiracy against the common people, or is it about rising inequalities and people feeling themselves threatened uh, because of uh, economic transformation we are all going to face? So uh, this, is, this is my question. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, Ibers. And now uh, the floor goes to Madame Delbos uh, Caulfield for her question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Very, very interesting. I hope it's only the beginning of the work we are doing on this because I, I do think we are not acknowledging enough uh, this very harmful uh, trend. Um, I have a lot of questions. The first one would be how does it um, exactly become viral? Is it completely spontaneous or would you say that there's also uh, an organization between the first ones that send the super, super spreaders and, and, or, or others uh, and then are, are there, is there a very organized net basically to, to make it spread? Uh, my second question would be you, you emphasized um, all of you the, the last COP. Uh, have, you, have you seen that there are special events or moments where, where it is uh, organized so it would show that it is very, very clearly organized if it's at very specific moment when some laws are being prepared or, or some new rules? Um, third question is, in this uh, INGI committee, we have been working also a lot of, on country, um, outside EU country interference. You have talked a lot about the big companies behind this. Would there be also countries or, yes, uh, specifically go some governments uh, that have an interest in this? Because we know that some countries live from uh, fossil fuels. So, fourth uh, is there a special interest for EU because we are quite um, uh, in advance on, on climate laws? Would you say that EU is more targeted than other places and specifically politicians in EU? Um, then are there links with other themes? I think I understood that, but it wasn't clear for me. Is, did you say there was a link sometimes with completist and, and anti-Semitic? I, I wanted to, to see, to have elaboration on that. Uh, is they linked with, um, I, I don't get the advertising thing. Is it, you, you, I understood Jenny King in your intervention that some companies are really not aware that their advertisement is linked at one moment to such false claims. So they are, they are um, this is, it, it can be really embarrassing for them, but is, are there some very specific advertisements that are linked in a very uh, uh, wanted way, that they, it's a will to be linked to these claims? Uh, and then my, my last questions would be more on the political side. So how harmful would you say this is? Okay, on the, in the big public opinion, it's, it's of course harmful and even more, but in, you know, like all of these people say, thinking that the election was trumped in, in, in USA or that uh, today people thinking that the planet is, is um, <clears throat> that you know, evolution doesn't exist and all this. I understand the harm done to the public, but um, how harmful is it on the politician? Do you think that as, this has a specific um, uh, impact? For example, you analyzed the COP. Would you say that you could see some changes of, of, uh, in the laws, that were, uh, what was discussed in, in the COP because of this? Um, do you think there is an interest for, of politicians for this disinformation? I come from the Greens. We should be the most interested. I find that there's a very big lack of interest in the Greens for this threat. Do you see this in general? I, I have the feeling that we are very unaware of the situation. Would you, would you agree with this? And Jenny, I didn't get your third Solution. I got the first two on transparency, and I, I can't remember the second one, but the third one we should have in this parliament, a uh, more elaborate definition of what. I didn't get your third uh, request. Thank you, Madame delbert Corfield. Now the floor goes to uh, Claire Daly. Madame Daly, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Javier. And uh, like Gwendolyn, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. I think it's very good that we're having... Uh, this discussion is something that's certainly under um, spoken about and I think the, all of the panellists have contributed very well to shedding light into the fact that what we, I think we would all agree on that this is a very real problem uh, and I think you have helped to serve light, shed light on how it's done. Um, but I'm more curious that is the, and it was very interesting to see the different diagrams and so on. But if you take, for example, the scale that the biggest attacks were personal attacks on scientists and then attacks on policies and so on, 
how effective, though, really is this? Because, I mean, you know, if you start personally attacking, say, five scientists, if the scientific world has a view, well, then there's only so many people you can personally attack. It doesn't seem to me to be a very effective way of going about uh, this. And is the issue that we should be discussing not really who is doing it and why they're doing it? And I think all of the contributors touched off this, but it does seem to be largely led by corporations directly or through funding front organisations. And if that is the reality, then we have to ask, well, how do you combat that and what is the purpose of that? And I think our, our speakers did that, that in many ways they're doing what the cigarette industry did or in time immemorial what corporations do. They want to make money for themselves and they're going to work the system as best they can to do that. So... Is that not what we should be combating, I suppose, is, is my first question. Um, that really where the emphasis should be is elevating science and divorcing science from corporations and from political influence through, you know, independent funding and so on. Would this be the best protection that we'd have? Now, people did spend a lot of time on... Um, alternative media, like I was interested in the Institute for Strategic Dialogue study, which I thought was very good. Um, but it's, I had two concerns with it, and one was about the emphasis on alternative media, on the internet and Twitter and all these kind of things, when in actual fact a lot of the climate disinformation is coming from mainstream sources. Because while that may have been, been going on online during COP, you'd have panels on the mainstream televisions with think tanks and mainstream anchor programme people coming out with much the same stuff that our panellists here have dealt with. I mean, it, one of the things in the Institute for Strategic Dialogue study was about uh, absolutism, that, that one of the tactics is delay it. Asher, we shouldn't be doing anything. Somebody else isn't doing it either. But the UK government and other governments, that's their, that was their calling card at COP. That's what they said. So I suppose my question is, I think climate disinformation is not something on the sidelines on alternative media. It's actually very mainstream. And how do you address disinformation policy if the disinformation is coming from the people in power, not the people on the fringes? Because I don't think it's a fringe narrative at all. That's my first thing. My second one is a slight little gripe about, about the, uh, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue study. And it was about the inclusion in the category of left-wing climate disinfo. Now, this didn't actually feature anywhere and no examples were given at all in the study. All of the examples were generally uh, of the far right and so on. So there weren't any um, examples, but there was a dangerous hint in it in the sense of talking about people who criticise COP uh, as being corrupt or hypocrisy around in it or elitism and so on. And that was criticised in a way that could be implied that this was climate disinfo. Whereas actually a lot of the people criticising COP and pointing out the hypocrisy, it wasn't a tactic of delay or denial, it was a tactic of haste and the need for more action. So a lot of the, I suppose, the category that was pinpointed in the glossary, like Greenpeace and Extinction Rebellion, called out COP for corruption and hypocrisy and elitism. This isn't climate disinfo, so you not think you have to be a bit careful on this and that civil society has to be given a certain amount of latitude. Otherwise, you know, people who are actually defending the climate can be, because they're the ones being attacked by the mainstream as climate disinfo people, that we need to give a protection there. Maybe not explaining that brilliantly, but climate activists are the ones who are under attack for disinformation in the UK, for example. So therefore, how we define this, how we have to be very careful. And in that sense, while I very much support the call for restrictions on paid advertising and so on, I'd be a little bit concerned about content moderation by social media groups that we don't have, if you like, what are essentially private corporate enterprises dealing with and moderating the content that might be put up by climate activists and so on. So maybe a little bit of commentary on that would be helpful. But I think it was really great that we're having this debate and beginning the discussion on it because it's definitely underrepresented and definitely incredibly prevalent. So thanks so much to everybody who did come in. Thank you, Claire. And now um, the uh, floor goes back to our uh, speakers, starting with uh, Mr. John Cook, initially for five uh, minutes. So, Mr. Cook, the floor is yours to 
uh, react to the uh, questions that have been uh, uh, posed here. So uh, we, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. I think I might start by um, addressing the question that was most uh, directly um, uh, addressing like my, my uh, presentation, uh, the question of how effective are personal attacks, uh, given that there are so many scientists to attack, so, so really can that make much of a difference? There is a very clear pattern to um, how or who gets attacked by um, in climate misinformation, and it's the scientists who publish the work which are the most impactful, that are the most persuasive uh, and likely to uh, increase public um, perceptions, understanding of climate change or public support for climate action. For example, in 1999, Michael Mann published the, the hockey stick um, research, which showed a clear um, signal of human contribution compared to uh, like natural climate change over the past. And for the last 20 plus years, Michael Mann and his research has been very intensely attacked. Um, I've also uh, personally experienced this. In 2013, we published research finding 97% agreement amongst climate scientists that humans were causing global warming. This research got a lot of attention and consequently myself, my colleagues and our research was very intensely attacked for a number of years, hundreds and hundreds of articles. Um, and so uh, this strategic focus of personal attacks on the most impactful and persuasive research uh, is, is quite effective and it also has a chilling effect on the scientific community. It can uh, disincentivize scientists from, from being more proactive and engaging the public with their research. Uh, the other question, um, which I think is most relevant to my field of research, which is the psychology of climate change, um, was about what makes people more receptive to climate misinformation. As a general rule, uh, the biggest drivers or, or influences of, of people's re receptivity to climate misinformation is um, both either political ideology, their political beliefs, or... Um, their political affiliation or, or their, their social identity. Uh, and the way to understand this um, is, a, is a phrase uh, in the research called solutions aversion. Um, people who don't like the solutions to climate change or the often commonly proposed solutions, such as government regulation, um, regulation of the fossil fuel industry, uh, not liking the solution they reject that there's a problem in the first place or they're more receptive to misinformation that argues that there isn't a climate change problem. Uh, now, p political beliefs and, and um, support for government deregulation or um, free markets uh, is, was in, in earlier the, a bigger driver, but over time as climate change has become more polarised, um, political affiliation... Uh, or people's social identities have become more and more of a factor, uh, and so um, so I, so that that leads to a, another question that I wanted to um, address, which was how do we address misinformation from positions of power? Uh, in fact, several studies have found that cues from political elites uh, are one of the most um, influential drivers of changes in public opinion about climate change. In other words, what we hear from our political leaders is highly influential on public perceptions of climate change. Uh, and so, so misinformation from politicians is really important. Uh, in, in an ideal world, I think that social media platforms wouldn't uh, just put politicians on a whitelist so that they can promote misinformation on platforms with impunity. Uh, but also, um, more generally, I think that uh, one solution to this, how we can address it, is by putting a price on denial. In other words, um, a political price for promoting misinformation. Uh, and a, a way to do that is to inoculate the public against the techniques of misinformation. This has been work that both John Rosenbeek and myself have focused on, um, explaining the techniques of misinformation, uh, inoculating the public through various interventions, whether it's through videos or inoculating messages or through, through games, which can also uh, engage um, the public and, uh, and in 
help explain to them, make them aware of the techniques used to mislead. Um, I think uh, I've covered several questions, but I'll, I'll hand over to the other speakers who can also answer them. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Now, the floor goes to Dr. John Rosenbeck again for five uh, minutes, roughly. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, with respect to your question about Ukraine, I thought that was a very interesting question. Um, of course, there is never one political challenge at a time that disinformation producers seek to exploit. And so in this particular case, I think uh, if you are uh, an agent seeking to delay climate action, let's say, and using disinformation to do so, the war in Ukraine presents itself as a wonderful opportunity in the sense that that allows you to um, redirect attention towards meeting immediate energy needs and so on and so on. And again, in principle, not all of these arguments are completely unreasonable. Uh, it is important that Europe's energy needs are met and because of this immediate and pressing crisis, um, the old avenues for meeting Europe's energy needs may not be as available as they once were. However, I think it is important to, uh, to note that none of this should distract us from the fact that a, an immediate energy transition remains imperative right now. And so um, it is good to look out for whether these messages that uh, sort of seek to promote um, increased use of fossil fuels to meet the challenges posed by the war in Ukraine, whether they are not heavily exaggerated whether they are not sort of misrepresenting the point in the sense that it is good to have a very careful analytical analysis of to what extent Europe's energy needs can be met using the current, um, hopefully as green as possible, energy framework. Um, there's several other questions that I thought I should address. Uh, one is, it was already partially talked about by John Cook, how does misinformation go viral? Is that usually organic or is that usually through bots and so on? Um, it's both, so it isn't really, you can't really say that mis- and disinformation is uh, primarily fueled by bot activity. Uh, what tends to happen rather is that uh, sort of the more sophisticated artificial amplifiers of mis- and disinformation tend to follow, let's say, strategic accounts uh, on social media networks that they view as sort of organic amplifiers of mis- and disinformation. And those accounts are often targeted with manipulative messaging in the hope that they will then amplify this. There was a very interesting article in The Guardian published just after the start of the war in Ukraine or the full-scale invasion, I should say, in February of last year, where uh, it was noted that a fairly hefty chunk of the Twitter bots that were producing misinformation about COVID-19 went dormant pretty much immediately after the invasion started and uh, subsequently started talking about the war in Ukraine. And so what that implies, although we cannot be sure because we have certain analytical limitations, is that um, a lot of the mis- and disinformation that we see online is basically a content agnostic, meaning the producers, whoever they may be, and I suppose I'll get to that in a second, they don't necessarily care whether the mis- and disinformation that they produce is about Ukraine or whether it's about COVID or whether it's about politics or whether it's about something else. The point of it often tends to be the fact that it's disinformation in and of itself and hope for that to go viral. Um, with respect to foreign interference, I think, uh, I hope I've emphasized uh, appropriately in my presentation that I think that we're dealing with a very complex problem that is amplified not only by foreign state actors, and it's okay to name names, I think Russia is one of them pretty objectively, um, but so are other countries, for example, Iran and China are often mentioned, or the People's Republic of China, I should say. Um, but also, unfortunately, though that may be, um, state-run companies such as Saudi Aramco, which is the Saudi state oil uh, company. And then there are also corporate actors such as BP, ExxonMobil, and so on, which are not necessarily state-run, but nonetheless have a vested interest in making sure that what you might call PR campaigns, or if you want to be coy about it, disinformation campaigns, um, generate as much attention as possible. So to summarize, it's definitely all of these things, and I think it's good to be aware of that. Um, 
let me see, is there, how much time do I have left? I have what, sorry? Thank you. <laughs> um, how harmful is this kind of mis- and disinformation? I think was one of the questions that was also asked by um, Representative Delbo, I believe. So there is a lot of debate within the research community as to whether misinformation has an impact on certain behaviors such as voting. And that debate is currently ongoing. We do not have a strong answer to that question. But um, I think what perhaps is a better focal point for these kinds of discussions is not whether the general issue of mis- or disinformation can have a negative impact on certain behaviors or other outcomes that we care about, but rather uh, what are the actual outcomes that are important here. And I think as the example that I mentioned of the tobacco industry shows, oftentimes the goals can be very simple. The longer you delay meaningful legislation to combat smoking in public areas, the more successful the disinformation campaign. Now, that doesn't in and of itself require a huge chunk of the public to be persuaded that smoking is good for you, right? All it really requires is that a substantial enough chunk of the population, and by extension lawmakers, um, has a fair share of doubt about whether that's the case or whether smoking is harmful at all. So in that sense, um, I believe that the impacts of these kinds of mis- and disinformation campaigns are evident in many regards. It's just that we can't make broad sort of sweeping claims about whether, for example, um, the Russians made Trump win in 2016. Those kinds of statements are not, in my view, analytically correct. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rusenbeck. And now uh, let's go back to Mrs. Jenny King. I wonder what the um, you have been able to improve the quality of your, of your audio, so you fingers, can be interpreted. Fingers crossed. Um, there were a huge number of questions, and uh, some of them I think would require more in-depth consultation, and I'd be really happy to speak to, to any of the committee members about what's been discussed today. I'm going to break down my responses into three buckets. One is around sort of how this, com- this information spreads and why. The second is on the harm and impact of that information. And then just finishing off with some clarification around the policy asks. On that virality question that came from Representative Delbos Caulfield, Representative Daly and others, disinformation thrives in moments of crisis and in particular moments where the fabric of social life is breaking down for one reason or another. That can be economic crisis, social crisis, political crisis, and disinformation actors are nothing if not opportunistic. That is how this ecosystem survives and how it continues to achieve impact. And the Ukraine war is just one in a very unfortunate series of turbocharging events that has fueled both the issue for climate change, but also for other policy areas. Um, COVID was one, the cost of living crisis is another, and now we have the ongoing repercussions and fallout from the conflict. So what you have are a confluence of factors that are creating the most fertile soil we have probably seen in recent history for this kind of information to penetrate the mainstream and to mobilize the kind of general public audience who may otherwise have never engaged or even come into contact with this sort of narrative framing beforehand. The other, which I think was a really important point um, by Representative Daly, is around the role that mainstream media play with this. And I would like to reiterate that point that in the large flagship report we produced in 2021 called Deny, Deceive, Delay, that we had an entire section about the role that mainstream outlets across broadcast, print and digital were playing in both amplifying and platforming the worst examples of mis- and disinformation. And we actually analysed the URL or the domains linking to media outlets that were most commonly cited across social media. And one point I'd like to emphasise there is that a lot of outlets are towing a very conscious line in 
making sure that their reporting in their sort of breaking news sections comes across as more sober or more neutral, and then providing space in their op-ed and feature pages for some of the worst examples of outright denialism, attacks on climate scientists, attacks on institutions, you know, rejection of science, etc. And that's how they balance it out, is by saying, oh, well, you know, we carve out a space in our opinion pages for this diversity of um, of viewpoint, um, and I could give you know a range of examples. I would also say that the UK and the US media are currently serving as content hubs transnationally, not just in the English speaking world, you know Asia Pacific, but also in contexts across the European Union for originating climate denial arguments, which then get excerpted, translated and reposted in the domestic media environment. So that is a very important part of this equation. Going to Representative Grappini's point, what we've seen happen with climate is it become an axis for polarization. So an issue set that can drive division, regardless of the substance of the policy that's being discussed. And I think one really good example of that is the climate lockdown conspiracy, which ISD wrote a kind of forensic unpacking of a few years ago, and which is resurging now with the, with the pushback around 15 minute cities and traffic calming measures. And that's an example where exactly what you were talking about that climate, the climate and gender is increasingly being framed writ large, you know, regardless of what policy is actually being discussed, the entire notion of combating climate change is being framed as a pretext to implement authoritarianism and to strip people of their civil liberties. And that that has very little bearing to the real public consultations that are happening around mitigation and adaptation. And it's much more a form of tribal polarization that is to do with identity and and where people see incursions on their liberties, particularly in the aftermath of COVID-19. And what's happened in the process is that the fossil fuel industry and those kind of very well-funded think tanks, lobbyists, PR groups have come into collision with this much more organic and amorphous blob online of extremist and conspiracist movements and ideologies. And just to comment very briefly on the hostile state interference question um, from uh, Representative Delbos Caulfield is that I would say some of the, uh, the case studies that we've documented, for example, in relation to Russia and China, so Kremlin-sponsored propaganda networks, Chinese state media, are exploiting those fractures. Yes, they might have geopolitical positions that they want to land in terms of maintaining reliance on oil and gas, but actually a lot of the, of the propaganda or articles in RT Germany, for example, are instead trying to prey upon this supposed elitism within the climate agenda and drawing an us versus them frame between different pockets of society and between different political parties. And a really interesting trend from around COP27 was that they were couching this opposition to climate action in supposedly progressive rhetoric. So, for example, they were pitting the global north against the global south by saying the net zero agenda is counter to human rights and it's going to keep people in Africa in poverty. So they're actually using what comes across as kind of liberal language in order to make an argument for maintaining reliance on oil and ultimately not pursuing uh, any form of, of the Paris Agreement or the COP platform. In terms of harm and impact, really briefly, um, to, to Representative Daly's point on the, on the far left thing, I think the only reason that we put that in the glossary is just to show an awareness that disinformation can come across from across the political spectrum. The vast proportion of what we've documented in terms of high traction and harmful content has come from the far right or extreme far right end of the spectrum, but it doesn't mean that it cannot come for those who might affiliate or self-identify elsewhere. And in terms of impact, I think there is a huge danger in assuming that climate is a settled topic um, and sort of resting on our laurels from a communications perspective. And, and I do think that without a strong public mandate, you are going to see a weakening of ambition, both within domestic governments and transnationally. And also you're gonna see 
potential escalation to violence, like what's happened in Oxford with this 15-minute cities controversy, councillors there received death threats. We had, you know, British fascist groups protesting with placards on the streets of that city and being bussed in from all over the country. There is the potential for real world harm here. There is the potential for escalation to violence. And there is the potential that we stifle the level of urgency that is needed to really achieve progress on this topic. Ditto at COP27, we're never going to be able to say one tweet influenced the negotiated outcome. You know, causality of that nature is too difficult to, to substantiate. But we can say that there were 650 lobbyists present at the summit, as documented by Global Witness, and it's difficult not to see the impact that that had in the text in terms of the weakening of language around the phase out of, uh, you know, fossil fuel reliance, etc. And then very finally and really quickly on the policy asks, um, uh, Representative Doubles Caulfield, what we were saying is that there's the need for a strong definition and that that needs to come from a multilateral institution. So a definition of what climate mis and disinformation constitutes and therefore what we are actually trying to tackle through scientific and media literacy, public education, community consultation and engagement, etc. And that without that, it is very difficult to galvanise a coordinated response. And then on advertising, that there are two things happening in parallel. One, as you mentioned, is that some brands are advertising on the worst disinformation sites without even realising, and so they're giving money to, you know, RT or to Breitbart or wherever it might be, without realising because they're going through these intermediary ad tech providers like Google and Amazon. But then equally, actual disinformers are also using advertising products and services on platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. So it's two different and quite separate parts of the equation, both of which fuel disinformation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. And um, thank you to all our speakers uh, for their remarkable contribution uh, to, this, uh, to this session on such an important issue as, 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 climate, uh, as climate change. So uh, we uh, kindly ask them to uh, disconnect so we can finalize our session in the, in the committee. If there are no requests, we will move to the last point of our agenda. And it's about the next uh, meetings. The dates of the, next, uh, of the next meetings are Tuesday, 21st March, from 9 to uh, 10.30, which will, will be uh, holding the ordinary meeting. And from 10.30 to, uh, to 13, um, we will be holding a parliamentary meeting. So uh, at the end of this session, I would like to thank our speakers again, members,